Ooh, let me tell you, I've had a couple little adventures, but uh, I'm swinging and missing on the on the final cut. I've gone out turkey hunting and have run into turkey across the creek and called and called and called and couldn't get them to come across the creek. I've crossed the creek looking for them and they shut up on me. Ran into hogs while I had a turkey gun in my hand and didn't have slugs. Um, pinpointed the spot, snuck around with my 6.5 Grendel and uh, the hogs had already winded me and moved out. Um, took my daughter sailing, uh, was uh, practicing my new uh, rod holders uh, for my sailboat. We capsized the sailboat, lost the saltwater rod and reels to the bottom of the lake and Man, my action camera. It was a booger bear getting it out, of, out from the dock and the boat ramp. So whenever my daughter and I capsized, and uh, after I made sure my daughter was safe and she got up on one of the pontoons and I pulled my dog off of me and got her up on one of the pontoons, then I realized my rod holders were empty and they were no longer containing my pin saltwater rod and reels that I put in there without leashing. And everybody knows, you leash it or you lose it. Now, I've, I've preached that so many times, but I uh, never suspected I would capsize that fat bottom boat uh, catamaran, but I did. And uh, so anyways, I've even tried to film a video of me uh, finding those rod and reels by dragging the lake bottom with a big old heavy sinker and, and a size 10 treble hook. Still trolling for the rods. Whole lot of nothing happening. And uh, so... <laughs> I haven't been able to find them. I've been using the GPS with the plotter and I've been watching my, my route as I go across the lake and I turn around and I come back dragging the bottom of the lake and turn around and go back. But of course, we capsized in the middle of the main basin of the lake and it was deep and it is wide. And uh, I don't know exactly where we capsized at because at the time I didn't know I lost my rods. I was more worried about my daughter and my dog. But uh, by the time I realized my rods were gone, it was a little late to be looking at the bank and trying to draw a crosshair on where I was located at. But uh, I got a rough idea, but uh, that hasn't been good enough because I've been out there three different times. Uh, so <laughs> it's been brutal trying to get a good video together. Uh, I've been going out. Uh, a couple of times I went out walking down the lake and uh, ran smack, smack into some hogs. Just ran right into them. And no camera gear. So I decided, I got this wild hair, you know, I'm going to do some photography on wild hogs. You know, you don't see a whole lot of just photography being done on wild hogs. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. My weapon of choice today is my Canon with a L L-series uh, Canon lens. Hopefully I'll get some good pictures if I can locate the hogs. I've gone out there six, seven times. I still can't find them daggum hogs. But if I walk out there without a camera, you bet I'm going to, I'm going to stumble right into those hogs. Uh, I've got a sow coming in to the backside of my property about every four days. She's coming in at one o'clock in the morning with her little ones. And uh, but anyways, I'm, I'm going to let the little ones grow up some, get them winged before I think about taking any of those. Went metal detecting with my dad. Had a good time with my dad. Found nothing but junk. I mean, nothing but junk. A lot of aluminum foil. And uh, it just, it wasn't even worth filming. We filmed it. It all went to the editing floor. One little adventure my daughter Alexis and I had here just a few days ago was she got a wild hare to go up to northeastern Oklahoma to uh, snag for spoonbill. And uh, it was pretty late in the year. It's we're talking. It was uh, after the first week of May, and so the spawn's pretty much done. But hey, we loaded up the jet ski and the uh, the trolling rig, and uh, we went over to uh, the Osho River, and we trolled. Uh, didn't catch a darn thing. We were on that jet ski for six hours straight, and never set foot on ground until we were done. Now it's just a lot of. Rolling up and down. 
She's playing that stump bass down there. Oh, she played it well. Yeah. Caught it. <laughs> get the net. Get I thought the it was net. a stump bass, but it's not. It's a tree bass. There was people on the banks casting and ripping hooks through the water. There was guides out there fishing. Uh, in six hours, we saw one paddlefish boated. There were paddlefish in the water. Every now and then I would see one surface, but it's a numbers game. And when you're trolling through the water with this little hook, well, actually it's a big hook, but uh, but compared to the surface area of the, the water, it covers a very small percentage of the river as you're going through it. And uh, those guides, they may have six, looks like six, eight rods sticking out the rear end of their boat. And uh, they can literally do a grid search of the river. But Alexis and I, two fishermen, two rods, one hook each. And uh, we were not able to, uh, to win that numbers game. It's a great time, you know, having these little adventures with my family, my daughters, with my dad. But, uh, but like I said, just uh, <laughs> we're not connecting at the very end. And, uh, and I don't want to bother, bother you folks with, uh, with a video and not getting anything at the end. That can get a little old after a while. But, uh, but like I said, sometimes it's a swing and a miss. Uh, I've got a hunt coming up here within just a day or two. And uh, we're going to try to go out and uh, knock down a couple of hogs down southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, I'm going to start out with a night vision scope. Uh, but with that being said, um, I got to thinking you guys are going to start seeing some video footage coming up here, hopefully, uh, with me using night vision scope. So I thought, you know what, might as well talk about that scope that, I, that you're fixing to see some footage on. And because uh, I know there's probably people out there like me that uh, are interested in considering buying a night vision scope or possibly um, thermal vision. I don't know jack about thermal vision other than what you see on YouTube videos, but I have had some experience with this, uh, with this night vision scope. I've had it since last year. Uh, I think I bought it in the fall of last year. So, uh, so I've had a little bit of experience with it and I didn't want to talk about it until I've actually played with it a little bit. With that being said, here comes some information on that. Now keep in mind, I am not an expert. Uh, this is my first experience with night vision scopes. I haven't ever had any other night vision scopes. I had a night vision camcorder, RCA camcorder, many years ago when I was in my 20s. Um, and I have not messed with thermal, uh, thermal scopes. So my experience is with this particular night vision scope. What I went and picked up was the Sightmark Wraith. Now this is not going to be an open box review. I absolutely hate those. I couldn't imagine anybody else wanting to watch an open box review where they don't even take the item out and test it and play with it. Uh, open box review Looks like uh, Christmas time in front of your red-headed stepbrother where uh, he didn't get anything for Christmas. So it just it looks totally worthless to me. So what I've done is I've mounted it to my 6.5 Grindel. All right. This Wraith comes with an IR uh, torch. And the IR, IR torch is actually pretty impressive. Uh, I ordered another IR torch from uh, well I thought was bigger physically it was bigger bought it from China mm. red flag uh, and uh, wasn't near as powerful as this little jewel right here the wraith you can use both during the day and during the nighttime you don't have to worry about too much light entering the lens it has a cap here but you take the cap completely off whenever uh, you're wanting to view something during the day or nighttime. There's no little pinhole in the cap there, so you don't have to worry about anything like that. Uh, it has recording capability, video, not audio, at least not this model. I suspect they'll eventually come out with a model that, that has the audio also. Why they wouldn't, I don't know. Uh, in my opinion, my opinion, uh, this is basically a camcorder modified into a scope. That's what this amounts to. When you look through here, through this viewfinder, you're not looking at an optical lens. You're looking at a video screen. 
just like a camcorder. Now it has an optical lens at the end here, but back here, that's a video screen. But with this being electronic, it gives you an incredible amount of recticles that you can pick out. Colors of recticles, which really tickles my, my daughter, so they, they like to pick special colors for the recticles. Uh, you can go from all kinds of different crosshairs, lines, dots, all kinds of stuff. It's uh, pretty impressive. Over on the side, it operates with four AA batteries. I use rechargeable batteries. If you're using a bipod or tripod or monopod, and uh, especially on a, if you're using a 6.5 Grendel or anything heavier, you might want to use one. You can always uh, tape a battery pack to it if you want, or you can attach a battery pack to your gun if you like. Because on the side here, this little side flap opens up and it's got a spot for a micro USB port where you can run this scope right off of a battery pack and it doesn't even dip into the battery life of your uh, your four AA batteries. Also has a micro SD card here for recording. Menu, super easy to navigate through. Really easy. Also another thing I really like, which you'll see on other reviews that you check out, Sighting this thing in is is pretty awesome. Uh, they talk about shooting three rounds. You don't need to shoot three rounds. Shoot one round, set it over for the uh, for sighting in, and what it'll do is it'll give you two different recticles. Fire a round, and then take one of the recticles and move it over to where the bullet actually hit, keeping your first recticle on the bullseye. Hit the OK button and it automatically adjust, and you're zeroed in. Bam, that easy. But of course, as most shooters know, you shoot three times, get you a group, and you go from there. But, uh, but if you're dead on with the first shot, and the first shot felt good, what the heck? Hit okay, and see how your, your second round flies. Okay, now, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, the joys of getting older. Okay, on the specs, it says this is a 4 by 32. No, it is not. They can claim that all day they want, but uh, it's not. I'll add a little video footage to that. So at the, la at the lowest setting, they say this is a 4 power. My Beretta ARX has a 3x9 variable scope on it, okay? Whenever I adjust this to 4 power, within reason, the field of view should be very similar to the 4 power, the base power of the Sightmark Wraith. It is not, as I'm sure they are quite aware. Okay, we have a heavy overcast it's raining that's my pond out in the backyard the waterfall is at 55 yards from where I'm standing of course with the uh, smartphone you have a pretty wide field of view this is what you have with the sight mark wraith and this is at its lowest setting at 4 power Now we'll put the Beretta ARX on here with its scope and set it to 4 power. Okay, ARX is set up, set to 4 power, and now let's see what we get. As you can tell, we get a much wider field of view at 4 power. In order to get the same field of view as the Wraith, I'm going to have to zoom this in. Okay, there we go. That's roughly the field of view. Uh, it's probably giving it a little bit. But even at that, even at that, and I swear there's still a, a little bit wider field of view on this scope. 
and I'm still dialed up to six. So in order to get the Beretta ARX scope to match the power that's on the Sightmark Wraith, I had to dial up the power to six power in order to even come close to matching the supposed four power, uh, minimum four power on the Sightmark Wraith. So uh, it is not a four power. Now I haven't checked the upper end, the 32, because honestly the 32 is worthless. Uh, when you start zooming in, everything gets so pixelated. Uh, at 32, you're probably not even going to mess with zooming it in that much. So, so the other end of the spectrum, it's not even worth even having a conversation on. The low end of the spectrum is extremely important. And uh, in order to get it to match a, a regular scope, um, it's, it's six power. That's what the Sightmark Wraith starts at, is six power, not four. So your field of view is not going to be what you think it might be. If you've got a bunch of rifles sitting in your closet and, uh, and you've got variable scopes in there, you know roughly how well you can see and what field of view you can see with a four power scope. That's not going to be the situation with a Sightmark Wraith. It's going to be six power. So it's going to bring it in quite a bit. In some situations, that's not a big issue. If you're where this uh, Sightmark Wraith excels at, it's it's a fine dice scope, you know. It doesn't have the clarity that a lot of your optical scopes have. It just because it's a digital scope, it's it's not going to. It's it's going to be pixelated to a degree. Uh, at your low power, it's fine and dandy, looks good. You can record with it as you zoom in. Uh, it's going to get more pixelated. As you zoom in, you're still going to be able to see your kill zone without any problem. As far as recording quality, <laughs> and not, not any good. Not any good. It's, it's not going to look good at all. So. Don't even think about that. Um, but but you will be able to see, see your kill zone. Not a problem there. But where the Sightmark Wraith excels at is the night vision. Uh, I am so impressed with how well you can see out across an open area with this night vision and that IR scope. Um, I would say pushing right at 250 yards. You should be able to pick something out at 250 yards. Clear night, clear visibility, nothing in the way. All right, and I say that for a reason. This scope excels in the area of hunting things like hogs at nighttime anywhere from 100 to your 200, right at close to your 250 yard mark. Somewhere in that area where the animal's not moving super fast, they're out there digging up a field, taking their time, and it's an open field with maybe a few dotted trees here and there. That way once you fire off that first round, you can still track the animal and get in another shot on another animal if you need to. Um, another thing is for in close if you have this attached to like say a 22 and you're shooting around a, a you know an old abandoned farmhouse and you're, you're popping rabbits or rats or something like that check your game laws every state's different. If you're doing something like that, uh, raccoons at night, again, check your game laws. Uh, small animals like that in close, not a problem. Where it crashes and burns is if you're calling something in, like say a coyote, and he's 70 yards out there, 50 yards, He's flanking you. He's trying to get downwind or something like that, you know, and he's running at an angle. 
you're going to have heck trying to get those crosshairs on him. That's just all there is to it. You're, you're going to have heck. It's hard to track an animal moving at the speed that a coyote does when he's coming into a varmint call. Uh, when you're starting out, it's six power. It's very difficult to do. Um, this scope excels at hitting things that don't know you're in the area. They're, they're just grazing, they're feeding, they're doing whatever, but they're not hunting. They're not actively chasing something. They're not actively trying to run from something. Uh, you're going to have trouble tracking them in that situation unless they're way out there and it's clear. Um, another area is um, wooded areas. I live on a wooded acreage. My parents have a large wooded acreage. It does have a pasture in it, but as far as the woods go, <laughs> this uh, night vision scopes uh, don't do good because the IR light hits a leaf and it reflects the light back at the lens and you're going to have white out on your lens. And it, it is um, very disorientating when you're looking at something out there uh, about 50, 60 yards, you're looking through the trees and all of a sudden you, you hit the back of some oak leaves and, and the light's blinding back in you and, and you've got a white screen. It seriously jacks with your pupils. Um, it is also a little bit disorientating. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen any videos where they talk about this. When you've got one eye looking at a bright screen and the other eye is seeing blackness out there. When you take your eye away from that screen, it's a little bit disorienting. Um, you'll get used to it. Your brain will adapt to it, and you will get used to it. But it, at first, um, it messes with you just a little bit. So just just keep in mind that your brain will adjust to that. But uh, but you're going to have problems if you're in a wooded area trying to use a night vision scope. Uh, a wooded area where there's a lot of leaves and stuff because it will reflect off of those leaves. Now again, if you're in a wooded area on an on a old uh, farm homestead and you're popping rats around, around a, an old abandoned house, that's not a big deal. Um, but if you're trying to track a coyote or even a, even a hog uh, through the woods with leaves, uh, you're going you're gonna to have some problems. Uh, another thing that will jack up this scope is the fog. If there's a lot of water molecules floating around in the air, that IR beam hits that water, it bounces it right back at that lens. And uh, you need a clear night. You don't need fog out there. Uh, rain is another issue. Um, it needs to be a clear night when you're shooting. So keep that in mind. Despite its shortcomings, it's a pretty awesome scope. It really is. It's a really neat scope. And it can be pitch black out there, no moon, no stars, no nothing. And when you kick on that IR light, you can see everything out there. It's all black and white, but you can see it all. And, uh, and I've got some videos I'll show you. And I've probably put in a few videos as I was talking just to break up my long, windy speech. But that's the basics on this scope. And it is the basics. If you have any questions, be sure to ask. Put them in the comment section. Um, comments, suggestions, opinions. We all have opinions. <laughs> but anyways, I plan on doing some hunting with this scope. I've done a lot of playing with the scope. Taking it out and filming deer, filming all kinds of different stuff. So I've got some hog hunts coming up uh, that I'm going to try to put some sausage in the freezer. Uh, that last hog you guys saw me shoot, um, I butchered it up and, uh, and the girls absolutely loved the sausage that I made out of that. 
Uh, in fact, they like the sausage better than the store-bought sausage. So I'm going to, uh, to load up uh, hopefully a couple of hogs on this trip coming up. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes from there. So anyways, I hope you found this video somewhat informative, uh, especially if you're looking at buying a, a night vision scope. Just be aware um, they got positives and they got negatives. And uh, depending on the situation that you're going to be hunting in, uh, it may be the perfect situation for you or it may be just an absolute no-go. Um, so, anyways, you'll just have to weigh that for yourself. All right, and with that, I hope you enjoyed the video, got a little bit of information out of it, and I uh, hope you enjoyed some of the little short video clips that I've, I added in here from the Sightmark Wraith.